Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining me today on Exegetically Speaking is Dr. Tremper Longman III. Not the first, not the second, but the third. He has a PhD from Yale University, that little school up there that nobody's heard of. He's a distinguished scholar and professor emeritus of biblical studies at Westmont College, author of lots of books and series and such. But Dr. Tremper Longman, good to see you, Tremper. It's great to see you, David. Thanks for inviting me. This is going to be fun. Now, how did you get started reading Hebrew? Well, I mean, I got started in kind of a traditional way and heading off in, I think it was 1975 to Westminster Theological Seminary. I knew I wanted to become a professor of some sort, but I wasn't sure Mm. what it was. And then I took Hebrew with the man who eventually became my mentor, Dr. Raymond Dillard. Mm. And first course I took with him was Hebrew. And he was such a charismatic teacher and really the biblical text, you know, kind of was deeply illuminated by his lectures. So uh, he's why I eventually went into Old Testament studies and why I ended up studying Hebrew and a whole bunch of other cognate languages eventually. (laughs) Yeah, they're kind of all related, right, in some ways at that point. Yeah, that's right. So was it easy for you or was it it a a struggle? Um, it, It took a lot of work, but it wasn't hard in the sense that, but you do have to put in the time and the effort but it's definitely worth it. It is worth it. And that's why we do this this particular yeah. podcast, right, to talk yeah, about it. Right. Now, today we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, really interesting passage. So much formative stuff is happening in the first 10, 11 yeah. chapters of Genesis. But here in particular is kind of uh, the second account, as it's called, of creation. Yeah. And it's it's taken from a particularly different point of view, right, from chapter 1. So set yeah. that up for us. We're looking at Genesis 2, verse 18. So tell us about that. Yeah, so... Um... As you say, we have two creation accounts, Uh, not that I believe that they're in some kind of deep conflict or anything, but as you say, Genesis 2 gives a different perspective on creation with the focus on Mm. humanity. And of course, in Genesis 2, 7, God has taken some dust to the ground and breathed on it to form the first human being who eventually is called Adam. And I should point out that this doesn't have to do with the Hebrew as the language per se, that I I think this is filled with figurative language, which is talking about a real historical reality. But But that connection to the earth, though, is so key, though, right? Oh, absolutely. Right? God made Adam from the Adama, from the earth, right? So there's this connection, deep connection. Well, and this figurative depiction is intending to tell us certain very important things about who we are besides the important foundational fact that god created everything and everybody including us i don't think it's necessarily telling us how he created us Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. in a literal fashion but the way it's described is telling us that you know we are creatures we're we're from the ground right Uh, Right. but we also have this special relationship with god that's signified by god breathing on the dust Mm. But then I always find it extremely fascinating that God then says, you know, it's not good for the man to be alone. Right, you know, right. I've, I've said to many students over the past that it makes me feel guilty about the advice I'd give lonely Christians in college when I was, you know, a fellow college Christian would come up and say, I'm really lonely. And I'd say, you have God, that's all you need. But, uh, here's... but it's not good, Loto. <laughs> yeah, right. And so when we come to Genesis 2, 18, you know, God is making the pronouncement mm-hmm. that he will make 
Ezer is the Hebrew word, mm-hmm. kid nigga do, you know. The Ezer word is the one that's attracting my attention mm. at this moment for a short comment, partly because Ezer can rightly be translated helper, but there are different types of helpers. Mm-hmm. And in this context, I think that if you study those cognate languages, uh, and in this case, Ugaritic, I remember back at Yale studying Ugaritic, which is a related language associated with a Canaanite-like people, that there is a equivalent word to Ezer, which commonly means ally. And that's a particular type of helper. And, and I think that combined with Kinigado, which means something like similar to him. I mean, literally, it's something like according to what is in front of him. But the emphasis is on equivalence. Hmm. So helper, some people might wrongly think denotes some kind of subordination. Right, right. Which, which if you studied the use of Ezer elsewhere, like in the Psalms, Yahweh's the helper of Israel. So it's not that kind of implied. <laughs> yeah. I like that term ally, though. That's, that's good. Yeah, Yahweh's yeah. Yahweh's the ally of Israel. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and actually I wrote a book on marriage with my psychologist friend, Dan Allender, and we derived our title from this passage. Mm. I didn't think to promote that book in this context, but now I will. Now, yeah, tell us about, yeah, you need to tell us about that. Well, it's called Intimate Allies. The Mm. book's called Intimate Allies. And so we take a look at particularly Genesis 1 through 3 and ask the question, what can we learn about marriage from Genesis 1 to 3? But it's this idea that, I, I, you know, David, I think the reason why people tend not to translate it ally in this context is because I think there's this idea that, wait a I minute, mean, ally is a military term, mm. and there's no hostility yet. There's no threat yet. However, Genesis 3, 1, when the serpent appears, we realize there is a potential threat out yeah, there. Yeah, there's always a potential threat, right? And the, you know, the idea is that the man and the woman together face the threats of life. And I mm. think it's an important kind of way to think about marriage today, too. Yeah. But that's on the negative side, but on the positive side, allies get to share of a lot of the, the good and the truth and the beauty and of life as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. One of the things we do in that book is we particularly explore the two-sided nature of who we are as human beings as, you know, in Genesis 1 through 3. On the one hand, we're creating the image of God and therefore reflect the glory of God. Mm. And so marriage is bringing out that glory in each other. But we're also sinners, and we have to remember that when mm. we're mm. in a marriage relationship. And we need to be ready to expect that there will be issues in marriage that we also need to then, of course, be ready to forgive each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go through that hard stuff as well. Yeah. But I love that reading of the text. And, and it is true that the word helper can sometimes connote, okay, well... I'm the electrician and he's my helper, you know, I'm the guy that really knows the stuff and this person, you know, just there in case I need a wrench or something. But the idea of ally really elevates that, I think, and said, okay, yeah. we're, we're equals, we're partners, you know, in this. We're co-equals. And it's in Genesis 3 that it seems like things begin to go south on that. But Absolutely. we'll have to explore that in another podcast. Thanks we so will. much, Tremper, for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. Thank you, David. Thanks to Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and Silvio Vasquez, who helped us produce this podcast. Thanks as well to John Alonzma, our Wheaton-based director, who makes this podcast possible. We're grateful to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you need to consider Wheaton College. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have amazing programs, a first-rate faculty, and some of the best students in the world. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for Modern and Classical Languages. Get started today. If you have questions about this or any of our podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions or questions about any passage in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament, send us an email, and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to weigh in on that for you. 
Our email is exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.